if the literal devil arrived in your hometown accompanied by a talking cat and a naked vampire queen, how do you think people would react? Mikhail Bulgakov's assertion was that in Soviet Moscow, they would have convinced themselves it had never happened, even though they had seen it with their own eyes. That's because he believed that communism had become a cultish, fanatical belief system, which meant Soviet citizens lacked the individualism to contradict its doctrine of national atheism. This is the central premise of his greatest novel, The Master and Margarita. This outspoken criticism of the communist system made Bolkakov a controversial figure. He was hated by many in the Communist Party, though he was defended by Stalin himself because the Soviet leader was a huge fan of Bulgakov's plays. It's rumoured that Stalin saw the days of the turbans at least 15 times. Writing The Master of Margarita was a huge undertaking for Bulgakov, which he poured his heart and soul into, even though he knew it might never get past the Soviet censors. It took him 12 years to write, including an infamous incident in which he threw the early manuscript onto an open flame a scene which is recreated in the final novel. The manuscript was finally completed in 1940, but due to censorship wasn't published until the 1960s, after Bulgakov's death, and it was heavily censored. The full novel, about 150 pages longer, was finally published in 1973. The novel is split into two sections which Bulgakov calls books, but has always been published as a single volume, at least in English. It is, to this day, regarded as one of the greatest novels ever written, and the best example of Soviet satire. In this video, we'll be exploring the literary techniques Bulgakov uses to make the Master of Margarita so powerful and so enduring, so you can use them in your own writing. I'll give you a quick overview of the plot before moving on to a deeper analysis. At the end of the video, I'll also give you a quick overview of the different English translations available with some guidance on which version you might want to read. That said, spoiler warning for this 80 year old novel, lest we fall foul of the censors ourselves. Book 1 opens on Patriarch's Ponds in 1930s Moscow. It's a hot day and strangely quiet. The poet Ivan Nikolaevich, known by the nickname Homeless, and Berlioz, head of the literary union Massalot, discuss Homeless's latest work. He's written a poem about Jesus Christ, and Berlioz tells him this is a mistake. Jesus didn't really exist. Homeless humbly accepts this criticism, showing interest in the sources Berlioz cites. Suddenly, Berlioz has a strange vision. He feels like his heart gave a thump, disappeared for a moment, then returned, but with a blunt needle in it. Just as he's beginning to recover, a stranger appears. He's dressed all in grey, with one green eye, filled with insanity, and the other black and empty. The stranger, who Homeless and Berlioz decide must be a foreigner, probably German, claims to be a professor of black magic, visiting Russia to advise on a necromatic text. The omniscient narrator hops between the perspectives of Berlioz and Homeless, so we can hear their thoughts as they take all this in. The stranger then tells Berlioz he's wrong about Jesus, because he met him 2,000 years ago. The chapter ends before we can learn anything more, but in the second we find ourselves in ancient Judea and are immediately introduced to Pontius Pilate. He is described as wearing a white cape with blood red lining. He's suffering from such a terrible migraine, he's contemplating suicide and can barely concentrate as a prisoner is brought before him. The prisoner is named Yeshua Hanotri, literally Jesus of Nazareth in Aramaic and he's facing a death sentence. Yeshua, a roaming preacher, is accused of inciting a riot in the temple, which he denies. He blames the incident on inaccurate records of his sermons written by Matthew Levi, a former tax collector who follows Yeshua around. As Pilate, still in terrible pain, contemplates suicide once more, thinking of a dark red wine laced with poison, Yeshua heals him. Pilate calls him a healer, but Yeshua says he's never healed anyone. Suddenly, Pilate has a terrifying vision, reminiscent of Berlioz's, an invitation to wonder what the connection is between the professor of black magic and Yeshua. Pilate decides he wants to pardon Yeshua from his death sentence, 
to have him declared insane and held at a location near his private villa so he can become Pilate's personal healer. But there's a second charge against Yeshua. Pilate asks Yeshua for his thoughts on Caesar, and though afraid, the young prophet tells the procurator that a new world will come, one free of governments, which he views as being inherently tyrannical. This is Bulgakov outright telling us the thematic truth of the book, making the case for individualism. Pilate argues the opposite, that Caesar, and by extension Stalin, have the divine right to rule. The chapter ends with Yeshua's death sentence being confirmed by the reluctant Pilate. Back at Patriarch's Ponds, Homeless feels like he's just witnessed the events in Judea firsthand, but dismisses this. It's impossible. He tells himself he was simply engrossed in a story the strange professor was telling. The professor continues to give his view on religion, saying there must be a divine power to govern because humans are incapable of doing so. He adds that even if they were capable, their mortality would render them ineffective. If a leader can die at any time, what true leadership can he offer? The professor follows this up by using the example of a stunned Berlioz himself, who, he predicts, will die that very night. He says Berlioz will be killed by a woman and miss the Maslet meeting because Anuska, a woman Berlioz has never heard of, had spilled the oil. He then turns his attention to homeless, who he predicts will end up in an asylum. Berlioz scoffs and leaves, but a few minutes later, Homeless hears his scream and rushes to see what's happened. He's just in time to see Berlioz's decapitated head bounce down the street and then his body crushed under a tram. In shock, he overhears a conversation from which he gleans a woman named Anuska had dropped her shopping bags, spilling cooking oil, upon which Berlioz had slipped and fallen to his death. Homeless realises that the strange professor's predictions had come true, and assuming he had somehow murdered Berlioz, gallantly runs back towards Patriarch's ponds to confront him. The professor is now accompanied by two other strangers, a tall, thin man with checked clothes and broken glasses, and a gigantic black cat. Homeless chases the trio around the city, but can't catch them. The cat makes a particularly funny escape, jumping onto a tram and somehow producing silver coins with which to pay the conductor. Homeless has the notion he'll catch up with the professor at the river, but when he gets there, feels compelled to get in and take a swim. When he comes back out of the cold water, he finds his clothes have been stolen, replaced with striped long johns. Pulling them on and trying his best to make them look like proper trousers, he heads back into the town. We're now at chapter 5 and we switch to a new point of view one of the Masalit members attending the meeting Berlioz had been heading to. From his perspective, we see Homeless arrive, still dressed in long johns and ranting like a madman about a strange professor and Pontius Pilate. He becomes violent and is literally carried away kicking and screaming to a mental health clinic where he's sedated. The professor's second prediction that Homeless would end up in an asylum has also come true. In chapter 6, we change point of view again another Moscovite and discover the professor's name, Woland. This subtly identifies him as the literal devil. The name is derived from a name Metistopheles uses to refer to himself in Faust. This is definitely not a coincidence, as Bulgakov included a line from Faust in his manuscript as an epigraph. I am part of that power which eternally wills evil and eternally works good. This is the first time in the story we are certain that Satan himself has come to Moscow, and we also discover a bit more about what he's doing there. He takes over the deceased Berlioz's apartment and reveals that he'll hold a seance of black magic at the local theatre that very night. He even has a contract for the performance, although no one remembers signing it. We switch again to Homeless's point of view. He's woken up from his sedation, and is still determined to go after Woland and his gang. But a doctor, who reminds him of Pontius Pilate, convinces Homeless to stay at the clinic and write a statement for the police instead. Homeless struggles to write the statement, constantly distracted by thoughts of Pontius Pilate, and begins to give up hope of going after Woland. He wonders why he's been so obsessed with getting justice for Berlioz, who, he reflects, he barely knows. He thinks that if he did catch up with Woland, he'd rather ask him more about Pontius Pilate instead. 
This is a dark moment where as readers we begin to realise that Homeless's character arc might be a more negative, nihilistic one than we're used to seeing from modern Western literature. Just as we're beginning to give up all hope for Homeless, a mysterious figure appears at his balcony window. We'll have to wait a chapter before finding out who it is though, because first, we get to attend Wolan's Sounds of Black Magic. Wolan sits centre stage in the theatre and allows Koroviev, the tall, skinny man we met earlier, to take the lead, along with the giant cat, Behemoth. The seance starts off fairly tamely with parlour tricks, but when the audience start heckling, things escalate. Koroviev makes money rain down from the ceiling, sending the crowd into a frenzy. Heckled further by the theatre's MC, things turn really nasty and Behemoth twists off the MC's head. With the severed head begging for mercy, Woland has Behemoth reattach it. Finally, Woland calls an end to the proceedings, and the whole setup disappears. We now return to Homeless once more, and he lets in the man at the window. He calls himself the Master, and reveals, I no longer have a name. I have renounced it, like everything else in life. The master also tells Homeless that he dislikes Homeless's poems, though he's never read any of them, and on reflection, Homeless agrees that his poetry is monstrous. The master advises him to never write again. The master then tells his own story. He was a history professor, and after winning a large sum of money, became compelled to write a novel about Pontius Pilate. He met a woman, Margarita, and they fell in love. She was already married, but would come to him every day in his basement apartment. She had been his secret wife and had become obsessed with his novel, reading it as he wrote. She was the one who had given him the title Master. He describes how when he finished the novel, publishers were unwilling to take it. Eventually, a magazine published part of the manuscript, but that made things worse. The literary community of Moscow turned on him, critics attacking him for the immorality of his religious work. The master had become depressed, even suicidal. He had tried to burn the manuscript, but the pages refused to catch fire, so he held them in the flame until they turned black. Before it was completely destroyed, Margarita had arrived and rescued the remains of the novel, which she still loved. She had told the master that she would finally leave her husband, so that they could be together somewhere far from Moscow. Still in the depths of despair though, the master had considered throwing himself under a tram, but instead had admitted himself to the mental health clinic. He hasn't seen Margarita since. As he speaks, the master gestures towards the moon, imagery Bulgakov constantly associates with the supernatural forces of his book. Homeless asks the master to tell him what happened next in the story of Pontius Pilate realising the story which Woland had told him must have been from the master's novel, but the master refuses to revisit his work. The next few chapters are seen from the point of view of various Moscovites as they deal with the fallout from the seance. Cab drivers and banks refuse to take large banknotes because the ones which rain down from the sky have been turning into bits of paper, or even, in the case of one cab driver, a bee which flew out of his wallet and stung him. The finance director of Maslit, Rimsky, is attacked by a naked, red-headed vampiress, who we later learn is called Hella. She claws at his window, and Rimsky is only saved by the rising of the sun. Eventually, we return to the clinic, and segue into our second visit to Judea, this time seen by Homeless in a dream. Matthew Levi watches Yeshua helplessly from a distance, the preacher bound to a crucifix in the blazing sun. Levi curses God for not allowing Yeshua's suffering to end, calling him a dark god of thieves. Suddenly, as if God had heard Levi's words, the sky darkens with storm clouds. A soldier approaches Yeshua and places a wet sponge to his lips, letting him drink. The soldier tells Yeshua he has Pilate to thank for the mercy. Yeshua asks the soldier to also give a drink to the two men crucified with him, and he agrees. He lets them drink, then stabs all three to end their suffering. As a huge storm hits, everybody retreats from the scene, except for Levi, who cuts the ropes holding Yeshua and the other men to their crosses. 
He leaves the others, but carries away the body of Yeshua through the mud. The last two chapters of Book 1 show more fallout from the seance, including a fairly self-contained story of a greedy barman trying to get money out of Woland, an even greedier relative of Berlioz, an economist who wants to use this family tragedy to inherit his apartment. This is a really interesting choice from Bulgakov. We might have expected to see Book 1 end with a confrontation between the protagonist Homeless and Woland, but we don't. What Bulgakov is clearly showing is that Woland, the devil himself, is not the villain of this story. The true antagonistic force is the Soviet system and its mechanisms of power. Homeless was part of that establishment, part of the Masalik clique, willing to sacrifice his own individualism and creative integrity. At the end of book one, he's been punished for that, and having seen this dark truth, has become disillusioned and demotivated. He's not chasing down Woland or trying to get justice for Berlioz anymore. If Homeless is to find any kind of redemption or resolution, it will have to wait for now. Book 2, though a direct continuation of the same story, is very much its own thing, with its own three acts and its own protagonist. The book opens with that protagonist, Margarita. This is her first appearance in the novel other than in The Master's Reminiscing. Margarita sits alone and reads the fragment she was able to save from the Master's manuscript. Jerusalem is gone in darkness, descended from the Mediterranean Sea. She's been having strange dreams and believes she will soon see the Master again, in life or in death. As she walks through town, she sees a funeral procession for Berlioz, whose head has apparently been stolen, and knowing that most of the mourners will be from Masalit, she wishes she could gatecrash and get revenge on the critics who had driven the Master to despair. She thinks to herself she'd sell her soul to know if the Master was still alive, and at that exact moment she meets Zazazello, another of Woland's entourage. He's described as having fiery red hair under a bowler hat and a fang protruding from his mouth. He offers to introduce Margarita to a rich foreigner, and she thinks he's a pimp, propositioning her. He quickly wins her over though, telling Margarita that the Master is alive and that if she comes to meet Woland, she'll learn more. Margarita agrees and Azazello gives her a special cream, with instructions to put it on her body that night and wait for him to call. She follows his instructions and the cream not only restores her youth, but gives her the power to fly and turn invisible. She leaves her husband a goodbye note, saying, My misery has turned me into a witch and heads off to meet Azazello. En route, she decides to take a detour to the apartment of Latunsky, the critic who ruined the master. Finding he's not there, Margarita begins vandalising the apartment with vengeful glee, flooding it and then flying round the outside on her broom, smashing all the windows. At this moment, Margarita comes across a young boy who has been scared by the breaking glass, and she shows her gentler side, comforting him. She tells him a story about a woman who had no children and no happiness and cried and cried and cried until she turned wicked. Margarita finally arrives at what was once Berlioz's apartment and is greeted by Azazello and Korovyov, who explains the apartment appears huge because he's mastered fifth dimensional space. Margarita is certain now that the man she's here to meet must be the devil himself, but she's not afraid. She learns that Woland throws a great ball every year, always in a different city. Because Woland is a bachelor, he must find a hostess for the ball, with the only rules being that she must be from that city and must be called Margarita. All the other Margaritas in Moscow have been deemed inadequate, so Korovyov offers the role to her, which she accepts. When Margarita is finally introduced to Woland, he's lounging around in his nightclothes and playing chess with the giant cat Behemoth. This is a really hilarious scene, as Woland mocks the cat for wearing a bow tie, to which Behemoth responds, it'd be ridiculous to attend a ball without one. The cat, who is losing the game of chess, then attempts to cheat by enchanting his king while Woland is distracted. He has it jump off the table and hide so it can't be checked. Margarita is named Queen Margot, as Hela, the naked red-headed vampire from earlier, bathes her in blood. 
Korovyov informs Margarita that she's descended from a French queen, and a quick Wikipedia search suggests this was the 16th century Queen Margot, who was forced into marriage to keep the peace between Catholics and Protestants. The party may now begin, and Margarita is told she must give great attention to every one of the hundreds of guests. She must make each of them feel special. If she does this, she'll be rewarded. Most of the undead guests are famous or notorious figures from history, but Margarita becomes interested in the story of a common woman, Frida, who was raped by a shopkeeper. Nine months later, Frida had given birth to a baby, but smothered it with a handkerchief because she couldn't afford to feed it. She is now forever tormented by the handkerchief, appearing wherever she goes, her own personal hell. Margarita asks where the shopkeeper is, expecting him to be in hell too. Behemoth tells her he wasn't the one who harmed the baby, which enrages Margarita, who pinches the giant cat demon viciously on his neck until he squeals with pain. Margarita, in a show of kindness, then offers Frida a glass of champagne, causing shock by showing her preference over the more distinguished guests. Woland appears, but he's still dressed in his bedclothes and slippers. A tray is brought before him, and the still alive and suffering, decapitated head of Berlioz is revealed to Margarita's horror. Woland says that as Berlioz believed in nothing, he will go to nothing, at which point the head shrivels. Woland has the head filled with blood and offers the grim goblet to Margarita. She drinks the blood, and suddenly all the undead guests fall, becoming corpses and dust. A door appears, which she walks through. The ball is over. Back in the apartment, Woland tells Margarita she's clever for not having asked anything of him. He says that one should never ask anything of those with power, but wait for them to offer. He says Margarita can have one wish as her reward. Margarita is about to wish for the master's return, but again shows her kind and selfless side. She thinks of Frida, the woman tormented by the handkerchief, and asks for her to be freed from the curse. Woylan says that while he's extremely powerful, this isn't within the jurisdiction of his office, giving us an insight as to the workings of heaven and hell. Woylan tells Margarita that if she wants Frida to be forgiven, she should do it herself. Frida arrives, dishevelled and naked, and Margarita tells her, You are forgiven. You won't be given the handkerchief anymore. Frida falls to the floor, prostrating herself with a cross and Woland howls as she vanishes. Woland decides that as he technically didn't grant Margarita's wish, she can have another, and this time she asks to be reunited with the master this instant. The master appears, still wearing his hospital gown, and wonders if he's still mad and hallucinating. Woland asks the master who he is, and when the master explains he's an author who's written a novel about Pontius Pilate, Woland is genuinely stunned. He knows nothing about the master or his book, even though he's been reciting passages from it. Woland asks to see the book, but the master tells him all the copies have been burned. Manuscripts don't burn, declares Woland, which, as a bit of trivia, has become a Russian saying. Behemoth the cat jumps up to reveal he's been sitting on a copy of the manuscript all along, presumably as a booster so he could reach the chessboard. The master still fears that being with him will bring Margarita to ruin, but Margarita doesn't care, and Woland helps them return to the basement flat where they had been so happy together. In chapter 25 we get our third proper visit to Judea, and in the aftermath of the great storm we find Pontius Pilate considering what to do with Judas. Pilate knows that it was Judas who informed on Yeshua, and that there are people who would like to take revenge on him. We see Judas lured out of town by his lover, and murdered, and when we return to Pilate, he's having a dream about walking with Yeshua. He's racked with guilt at having not done enough to save the preacher, with whom he was strangely enamoured, and tries to convince himself the execution can't have been real, as he finds himself walking and talking with the prophet now. The dream is disturbed by his secret police, who bring in Matthew Levi. Levi and Pilate argue bitterly, Levi tells Pilate he'll kill Judas in return for getting Yeshua, but Pilate vindictively tells Levi that he will not be able to. He's beaten him to it. 
The next couple of chapters deal with fallout from the party among the Moscovites, including investigations of Berlioz's apartment, which now appears abandoned but haunted. Behemoth and Korovyov go on one last hilarious adventure, which includes a shootout with the police and setting both the apartment and a local market on fire. Finally, they go for lunch at the restaurant where the Maslut meeting took place earlier in the story. They're asked for identification to prove that they're writers union members and have an argument with the staff over whether they'd expect Dostoevsky to provide identification to prove he was a writer too. As Woland and his entourage prepare to leave Moscow, Matthew Levi appears. Levi tells them that he, presumably meaning Yeshua, has read the master's work and wants the master of Margarita to be taken somewhere where they can find peace. We then rejoin the Master and Margarita in their apartment, where they're visited by Azazello. He offers them vintage wine, once owned by Pontius Pilate. They drink it, only to discover it's poisoned. The Master laments Azazello as a murderer, but having died, they both rise again. Margarita thanks Woland, and as they leave, they shout, Burn old life, burn suffering. They take only the manuscript with them. Woland and his entourage transform into their true spirit forms, and they, along with the Master and Margarita, ride out of Moscow on flying horses. They arrive in a forest flooded by the light of the moon. On a chair they see a man asleep, Pontius Pilate, in his white cape with the blood-red lining, who has lived here in purgatory for two thousand years. He desperately wants to leave, to walk with Yeshua again. Margarita suggests the punishment is too harsh, but Wolin warns her not to repeat the incident with Frida. Margarita, though, responds by screaming, Let him go. With such power, it causes an avalanche. Woland gives a bout of infernal laughter and turns to the master, telling him he can finally finish his novel with a single phrase. Understanding Woland's meaning, the master turns to Pilate and shouts, You are free, free. He awaits you. Lightning crashes down and Pilate rises from his chair at last and runs up a moonlit path, free to walk with Yeshua. With that, Woland guides the Master of Margarita to their new home and departs, vanishing. The Master and Margarita have their happy ending at last. Not quite heaven, but for them something better. An eternity together. After that tearjerker of an ending, there's an epilogue. It wraps up the arcs of many of the Muscovites we've met during the story before we visit Ivan Nikolaevich, a history professor who was once the poet homeless. Years have passed and he doesn't write anymore. Like the other Muscovites, he believes he was the victim of hypnosis and a mental breakdown, that the devil never really came to Moscow. But every full moon, he becomes agitated and restless. When he wakes screaming in the middle of the night, his wife will inject him with sedatives. Falling back to sleep, he always dreams of Pontius Pilate and Yeshua Hanotsri. They walk the moonlit path. Pilate pleads to Yeshua to tell him the execution never happened, and Yeshua kindly lies to him, and tells him that of course it did not. Out of the moonlight then appear the Master and Margarita, Homeless will ask the master, who he instantly recognises, if this is really how the story ended, and the master will reassure him that it was. Margarita kisses Homeless on the forehead, and at last he can sleep an easy sleep. He is no longer tormented by the cruel fifth procurator of Judea, the knight Pontius Pilate. One of my reasons for doing this review was I remembered loving The Master of Margarita when I read it the first time. And rereading it, I was amazed by how good it was all over again. It managed to be fun and whimsical while tackling tough subject matter. It's equal parts hilariously surreal and extremely sad. Best of all, it has a ridiculously satisfying ending, bringing together all the plot threads from two timelines. So how does Bulgakov manage this? Well, let's examine how he handles the themes, structure and characters of the novel to find out. This is a novel which leans extremely heavily into its themes. Literature and censorship, economics and money, feminism and exploitation. It would be easy for a story with this many strong themes to feel muddled, 
but Bulgakov masterfully avoids this. He does this by having an overarching theme and making the others subsets of it. Early in the book, Yeshua blatantly states the thematic truth of the novel. Human governments are intrinsically tyrannical. He makes the case for individualism and freedom of expression. In this context, the literary theme becomes about the legitimacy of state censorship versus the artistic individualism represented by the master. The economic theme becomes about money as a mechanism of population control. The disappearance of the money Woland gave out during the seance exposes the illusory nature of that control. The feminist theme is about the oppression of women in Soviet culture. Margarita is told by Woland never to ask anything from those with power, but at the climax of the book, Margarita demands, not asks, but demands, Pilate is freed. By tying all these themes to the concepts of individualism versus state oppression, they come together to create an intricate but coherent whole, elevating the story rather than confusing it. Next, let's take a look at the interesting structural decisions Bulgakov makes. Rather than try to cram this complex tale into a conventional three-act structure, he splits the novel into two books. Each of those books is structured into three acts with its own protagonist, with a couple of notable tweaks to that formula. Because this meant to read as a single novel, Bulgakov does a huge amount of setup and world building in book one. This lays the foundations for the whole story. He then withholds the resolution of book one of Homeless's story until the epilogue of book two. This allows him to tell this incredibly innovative and complex story while keeping it well paced and coherent. He also does an amazing job at handling the framing narrative, the book within the book. There's always a risk with this kind of device that one of the timelines feels low stakes compared to the other, and therefore boring. But Bolgakov makes it very clear that the story of Pontius Pilate will be absolutely vital to resolving the main plot throughout. Bolgakov also makes really interesting choices of narrator and point of view. In the main timeline, around half the chapters in the book are from the POV of one of the two protagonists, Homeless and Margarita. The rest are from the point of view of other Moscovites who might get one or two chapters each, with the exception of the single chapter from the point of view of Korovyov and Behemoth. This is quite unusual, but very clever. The protagonists drive the main story beats, but the other point of view characters allow us to see all the wonderful chaos Woland is causing without the need for big exposition dumps. Regardless of the point of view character, the narrator is omniscient able to give us information that none of the characters have and head hop between the characters to see directly what they're thinking. Omniscient narrators are really out of fashion in modern literature and head hopping is generally considered bad writing, but both work really well here. There are two reasons for this. First, it's a very efficient way to give us information and certainty in such a complex story, which helps avoid bloat and confusion. The benefits outweigh the costs. Second, Bulgakov is very careful about how he uses these tools. For example, in the opening chapters, we jump between the thoughts of Berlioz and Homeless, but we don't get to see what Woland is thinking, which preserves the mystery and suspense of the story. Speaking of all these interesting characters, let's take a look at a few of them. At the start of book one, it seems like Homeless will be a conventional protagonist, trying to bring the murderous Woland to justice, but things turn out very differently. Having started off heroically trying to chase down the mysterious professor, he eventually becomes disillusioned and gives up on that. He's a member of the literary establishment, but through his encounters with Woland and the master, he sees a dark truth. He sees his poetry, censored and shaped by the likes of Berlioz, as monstrous. Eventually, he gives up on writing altogether, just as he gave up on his pursuit of Woland. He can only find solace in his dreams of the master and Margarita. Margarita is the protagonist of book two, and she's very different from Homeless. She's fearless, resourceful and passionate. Even in the depths of her despair, she's unafraid of standing up to Azazello. She embraces her newfound power as a witch and shows a dark, vindictive streak when she vandalises the critic Latunsky's apartment and viciously pinches Behemoth. Through book two, she goes from a woman trapped in an unhappy life by the material comforts it offers 
to one who's willing to risk the wrath of Satan himself to demand justice for others. It's an incredible journey with a deserved happy ending. The Master has a similar redemption, but he's less responsible for it. At the start of the book, he's fallen into indolence and obsession, and it's Margarita who drags him back to life, then death, then life eternal. He too, though, gets his happy ending, and at the last, really embodies the thematic truth of individualism. The take on Pontius Pilate is interesting and full of contradictions. He's stylish and cultured in his white cape with the blood red lining and genuinely empathetic to Yeshua's situation. But he's also depressive, masochistic, and in the case of Judas and Levy, spiteful. Ultimately, Bulgakov sums up his biggest sin as being cowardice in not saving Yeshua, despite wanting to and having the power to do so. In this, he represents the thematic lie, submitting to the power of the state. Wolun is an incredibly interesting take on the devil. The first huge decision Bulgakov makes with this character is that he isn't the antagonist. If he were the villain of the piece, he would represent the thematic lie, the power of the authoritarian state. Instead, he's the negation of the theme. He says clearly that human government is incapable of legitimacy because it's impotent. He doesn't use money to control people. He gives it away and then proves it's just an illusion. He's analytical and detached, letting his minions get excited and emotionally involved in events while he watches on. But he can be arrogant, even prideful, getting defensive when Levy calls his power into question. I won't say too much about Wolin's minions, but I'm glad to have had that hilarious late chapter from the point of view of Korovyov and Bechamoth. Bulgakov was very wise to avoid us peeking behind the curtain of what these two were really thinking until their role in the story was done, then offering it up as a bonus. And a final mention for the Moscovites, who were brilliant embodiments of the novel's thematic lies with their greed, cowardice and scheming. Bulgakov does a great job in revisiting each of them to give their individual stories closure. So, what are the big takeaways for us as writers? Well, Just as he challenged the Soviet state, Bulgakov challenged writing orthodoxy too. He bended and broke the rules, but very consciously and carefully. While conventional structure wouldn't work for his novel, Bulgakov didn't abandon structure altogether. Rather, he deconstructed and reassembled the theory to make it perfectly fit the story he wanted to tell. He made similarly unusual decisions on point of view and narration style, again did this in full understanding of what he was doing and why, to meticulously craft the experience he wanted for his audience. He was also happy to subvert readers' expectations on character, doing something much more interesting and unexpected than making Woland the villain of the piece. This has led to Woland becoming one of the most iconic depictions of Satan, even inspiring the Rolling Stones song, Sympathy for the Devil. In summary, What the Master of Margarita shows us as writers is that learning writing theory doesn't make you a slave to it. If you truly understand it, if you become a master, you can play with it, bend it to your will, and use it in new and exciting ways. If you haven't read The Master of Margarita before and you want to check it out, I highly recommend you do. But the multiple translations available can feel a bit overwhelming. I used four versions of the book conducting the analysis in this video, and here's my overview of them. The Glenny translation from 1967 is still regarded by many as the best translation, but it's of the censored version of the manuscript, missing a lot of content. The 1997 Richard Piver and Rissa Volonsky translation is the first version of the book I ever read, back when I was at university. I enjoyed it at the time, and is uncensored, but I don't think it reads as well as Glenny, or some of the more recent translations, so I'd avoid it unless you pick it up for cheap. The 2006 Michael Carpelson translation, which is uncensored and does a great job of capturing the humour and emotion of the story, is the only version I could find on audiobook, so if you're a fan of Audible, that's the one for you. And finally, if you want a modern translation of the full manuscript and you aren't bothered about audiobook, then the 2008 Hugh Applin translation has great reviews and a beautiful cover. I haven't read this one in full, but enjoyed dipping in and out of it and it might be the best choice for you if you want a nice paperback. I hope these tips will help you check out this incredible novel. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And if you have any comments on the video, or any suggestions for future videos, please leave them below.